Um, today's event is also dedicated to Professor Eileen Everson, who sadly passed away in March. Um, Eileen came to work what was then the new Ulster campus um, in Coleraine in 1969 and stayed for almost 30 years. She lectured in research in social administration and policy. Her deep commitment to addressing issues of poverty is evident through her career from her publications in the 1970s on poverty and unemployment in Northern Ireland, her work on family poverty and the social fund in the 1980s, and then later decades on CURS, poverty, lone parents, women and also pensions. She worked with ARC on a number of occasions, including on pensions and the minimum income guarantee, with regard to work on ageing, covering health, finances, ageism and challenging the way that an ageing society was pre presented as problematic. Eileen was passionate, a passionate advocate for change. She combined her academic role with a range of voluntary activities, working to enhance public and political understanding of social policy and campaigning for change, particularly with regards to poverty and social security. Amongst her many roles, she was chair of the Social Security Standards Committee of the Department of Communities Northern Ireland and also chaired the Welfare Reform Mitigations Working Group. She was probably best known as to the Northern Ireland public through her broadcasting career as the Ulster, really Ulster's benefits expert. Eileen brought integrity, honesty and expertise and wit to every project. So we're delighted that we can um, really use this event as well as part of a tribute to Eileen today. And now... I'm just going to hand over to Kira, who's going to do our turn for today's event. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Alexandra. Um, and just to reflect very briefly on, on Aileen Everson and the uh, kind of impact that she had on me in a very small way is that obviously she's a great inspiration for um, my campaigning and activism around poverty. I first become, you know, really aware of Aileen through the Belfast through the, the mitigations working group. And I think what was so particularly impressive about Eileen is how she was able to draw all of the political parties into that agreement um, to create uh, a, a better social security people or better social security system to give people the protection that they needed at that time um, and I think there's many of us in the room that are are trying to carry on the spirit of Eileen's work through all the different initiatives that we're working on and um, so hopefully we all feel a wee bit of Eileen in the room today um, as we have this really important discussion about poverty. So how this is going to work is uh, I'm really delighted and privileged to be chairing uh, this event with four amazing speakers that I have worked with in different capacities over the last few years. Um, so we have Tressa from Bernardo's and she's the Senior Policy and Public Affairs Officer. We have Siobhan Harding, who is the Research and Policy Officer for Women's Support Network. We have our colleague Sinead Fury, who's a Senior Lecturer in Consumer Management and Food Innovation. And finally, we have Kevin Higgins, who is Head of Policy at Advice NI. So each of the speakers is going to have about 10 minutes um, to present on their uh, various areas of work. Um, and then what we're going to do is go into a 30 minute round table discussion and you'll see a sheet of paper in the middle of all your tables and we've asked three questions um, and I think the three questions from memory is where do we want to be 25 years from now, uh, what do we have to do to get there and finally what can you do? So I think we're all feeling the despair of having no government at the minute. So to give us a wee bit of hope and um, I suppose motivation to keep doing what we're doing, we want to, to ask that important question of what can we all do at the minute, the way things are, to progress this important issue of poverty. Um, so we'll have about 30 minutes, or sorry, 20 minutes for that conversation and then I'm going to ask all the groups to feed back for 10 or 15 minutes and our panellists here will have an opportunity to respond at that stage to what the different groups are um, going to be focusing on. We have four themes. The themes are um, access to food, gender, children and the social security system. 
um, and you'll see what your theme is written at the top of your page. So without further ado, I am going to pass over to uh, Kevin Higgins to kick off um, our discussion today. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much, Kira, <clears throat> and thank you to ARC and to everyone who organised today's session. So it's a real privilege to be here, um, and I think it's just fitting that it's it's something that's for Eileen and memory of in memory of Eileen as well too. And in keeping with um, what Kira said around having Eileen's spirit in the room, um, maybe we could listen to this for a wee second. Eileen Everson, what will happen? when mitigation ends next March? Well, it's very important to stress that times are tough, but we're really concerned that times are going to be tougher still. We've had a programme in place for the last three years protecting people from the worst effects of the council benefit that have taken place in GB. They've caused a great deal of hardship. We've tried to protect them, but as you say, that programme comes to an end next March, and we are really worried. We're particularly we're worried about a lot, but we're really worried about three things. First of all, there is concern that the bedroom tax will come into Northern Ireland. Now, the bedroom tax tax is a situation whereby uh, tenants of housing associations, council tenants across the water, they're told you occupy too much uh, accommodation, you've got too many rooms, we're going to financially penalise you. Now, you could say, well, if people have too many rooms, they should move, but clearly in many, many areas in England and indeed in Northern Ireland, there isn't the supply of smaller, cheaper, decent local accommodation. So the upshot of that mess frankly, uh, is that you end up with arrears and evictions. And that's what we could see in, in, in Belfast and indeed Northern Ireland next year. So that's the bedroom tax. The other thing that we're concerned about, benefit cap. Benefit cap is the situation where government says to people, families, uh, we know you need so much to live on, but we're not going to give you that. What we've been doing over the past three years is plugging the gap. Clearly, if those families lose the support we're providing, that's hardship. Thirdly, we've got our own bespoke advice service because people with disability, particularly mental health, need so much help and we've got universal credit come down, coming down the line. If we lose our advice centre, we are in real trouble. Kevin, have any... So, <clears throat> just to set the scene or whatever, I mean, I think you get from that a sense of Eileen's well, her knowledge, her passion, and just how, how really well she can carry herself and, and win arguments or whatever and convince people. Um, and it was a lot of all of those skills she was able to bring to bear in the Welfare Mitigation uh, Working Group and was able to get all of that, that over the line. So, and just to say, towards the end of that interview, actually, Paul asked Eileen, um, well, we're nearly out of time or whatever, what would your message be for the politicians? Because that was back in 2019. Lo and behold, the Assembly was down back at that stage as well. And Eileen says to Paul, what could be more important than the suffering of our people? So that's always stuck with me. And I think we've all seen the Trussell Trust Food Bank figures out today. 80,000 emergency food parcels over this last year. So that same phrase, is, it's as live now as it ever was, which is, what could be more important than the suffering of our people? Um, I know it's hard to believe Eileen just passed away. That's three months ago now. Um, and I think all of us just, um, you know, had such a, an awe and admiration and, and respect for Eileen um, because of you know, her huge her drive, her, her knowledge, her total commitment to whatever it was she, she was doing. Um, and particularly for those people who find themselves on the receiving end of injustice as opposed to justice. So she was always on the side of people that were struggling or found, found themselves sort of lower down the pecking order to everybody else. Um, I know that she looked approvingly at the work of Grania McKeever and the work of the Independent Review of Discretionary Support and Les's work in terms of the review of, of the mitigations package that, uh, that she was responsible for putting in place. Um, and if memory serves me right, she fed into all of that as well. But our one big thing was around making actual practical differences for people. And, and I know that she would be impatient at this stage to see words turned into action, particularly if those two reports, and she'd want local ministers in place to actually implement the recommendations and, and very sensible recommendations they are too. As you heard in the clip, she was a fantastic advocate for independent advice. And, and just to recap on why independent advice is so, so important, um, there are many barriers out there that prevent people from going direct to government departments. Stigma, fear and trust would be just three, but there's many, many others as well. Um, and so people like to go to their trusted independent source of advice and information where they can tell their story and they'll be treated with dignity and respect and then given, given the best advice in terms of options moving forward. And of course, the ability of independent advice to challenge decisions, actually to stand up and to challenge authority. 
Um, and very often, uh, independent advisors will help people secure the rights at tribunal at beyond, which actually departmental officials can't do that. They can't challenge themselves. You need to have the independent advice there to do that. And I know Eileen was deeply interested and deeply knowledgeable in the history and context of our wel welfare state and deeply frustrated at the flippant disregard shown by successive UK governments from 2010 um, to the support put in place via our social security system. I say flippant disregard, um, if only they had flippant disregarded our social security system because they subjected it to about £30 billion worth of cuts over this last decade. Um, decade of austerity, particularly targeting sick and disabled families with children and the working poor. And then, of course, we fast forward to now. Um, this part of the world, our institutions have collapsed and we wait for a budget settlement for our departments. Um, currently, the, the money available for our departments are woefully inadequate. Um, and we all saw that leaked NIO paper where they're suggesting water charges, prescription fees, increased university fees and so on, all of which will detrimentally impact on our poorer households. And just to suppose, look forward a little bit and maybe introduce a little bit of optimism well, and to try and maybe help the conversations around the table around well, what, what could we do and what, what, what is to be done. Um, some things that we think are very, very eminently possible are around, in terms of a UK government response, actually look seriously at uh, income adequacy. You have people are trying to survive on benefits out there, and it simply just isn't enough to make ends meet. And even though we got the 10.1% up rating for this coming financial year, that was a real struggle, and we, it was touch and go whether that was going to be the case back in September that the government would agree to that. But even with that 10.1% uplift, we're still lagging way behind in terms terms of income advocacy. In terms of the Northern Ireland Assembly, what we're saying is when we're supporting people, don't focus solely on one-off lump sums of money. Uh, there's a lot of talk there yesterday around the cost of living payments that's gone out, £301. Um, but actually, that's, that's a one-off lump of money, and actually for a lot of people, they'll, they'll spend that in a day with a, a fill of oil or whatever it is. So we say do more work that'll leave a long-term legacy in terms of income maximisation. If you can get people uh, to access their full entitlements, in particular older people or families with children or people with disabilities. That's a regular income every week or every month that they can rely on. And I suppose as we, as we face into what is looking like austerity 2.0 or whatever, the three things that, that is sort of we, we see in our work and that we try to underline, which is don't lose the important services that we have. Um, and for example, independent advice services or, or other services, and we're hearing a lot about education at the moment, once those things are cut and taken away, you lose that expertise and they're gone, and the people that rely on those services will be hit and they'll be left in even more hardship. And it stuck with me, there's a headline back in 2017, which is anger over cut to school uniform grants in Northern Ireland. And can anybody say in the next coming days and weeks that we're not going to see that headline again, that our poorest families and children in education aren't going to see even more cuts? Can we, so let's don't lose what we have. Can we get a better tune out of what we have? And some of the ideas around that, for example, around auto-enrolment of people that are eligible for free school meals. If you look up the Department of Education website, you'll see it's something like there's only 75% uptake of free school meals and uniform grants. I mean, that's, that's absolutely ridiculous, and it's a damning statistic. There should be auto-enrolment so that 100% of children are getting access to free school meals and uniform grants um, when they're entitled to that. Lots of other ideas, but I don't want to I'll leave you to come up with a lot more of those as well, too. Um, but finally, a big challenge coming down the track um, is this government initiative that's called Move to Universal Credit. And basically what that's going to see is people on working age means tested benefits, the likes of your income support and housing benefits and tax credits and so on. Um, those people are going to be so-called moved across to Universal Credit. It's a huge undertaking, um, and we have huge concerns about people's ability to cope financially to cope with the digital process, because fundamentally Universal Credit's a digital, it's a digital platform, and to cope with this in terms of people's mental health and well-being, even just the increased conditionality and the fact that you'll get maybe pinged in the middle of the night with a text message to say, oh, are you doing all the conditionality that you should be doing in order to get Universal Credit? So there's, there's the money in the digital, but there's the intangible you know, health and well-being as well. 
And just to flag that uh, Vice and I, we did some research and we're actually launching it next Thursday. Um, so maybe you might be interested in attending that. If you go onto our website or social media streams, you'll see all the details. And we hope to stream it online too. So if you can't be there, um, keep an eye out and you might be able to log on and see that. So finally, just to say, I feel certain Eileen would be pleased with the wide variety of action and commitment that you're going to be hearing about from, from all the speakers um, being showcased today, plus all the brilliant work that's going on at grassroots local community level that you, maybe you don't often hear about outside of local communities. So I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. Thank you very much. And we'll have Shaniad up next. Um, and just to say that Johnny Curry from the Trussell Trust was actually in touch today to say that what maybe hasn't come across in the media is when those lump sum funds come into people's accounts, food bank use goes down. Um, and, you know, the Trussell Trust statistics show that. So it might not be in the media release, but he was keen for me to say that to the room today. So it's very common sense stuff. People have more income. Their need for the use of food banks or charitable food support decreases. And on that note, uh, I will now pass over to Sinead, who's going to speak more about food poverty. Thank you very much, Kira, and thank you, Alexandra, because I didn't spot that you had that uploaded for me already. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come along and, and speak this afternoon. And I'm just going to uh, sort of borrow heavily from, from Kevin's introduction there in terms of um, Ida Levinson's quote around uh, what can be more upsetting than the hardship of our people. And then um, the, the very fact that we've got 81,000 food parcels in Northern Ireland, 35,000 of those going to children, the worst, most damning statistics in five years. Hopefully then um, I don't really need to speak to this slide in terms of what are we doing, because this is supposed to be a basic human right that um, has been established since 1948. Bring it up to um, the present day and our sustainable development goals, the ambition very clearly being for no poverty, for zero hunger, and yet we have these um, horrible, horrible statistics for what is a really most basic fundamental right. So really all I'm going to speak to on this slide is the need to protect this right, this right to food, this right to our basic essentials, and to address the gap and the rising gap between income and food costs. So nothing new there, really, I hope. I'm just um, harping on um, um, in, in, in foundational support um, to Kevin and uh, Kira that went before. I'm going to speak um, for a couple of minutes now on, on food poverty specifically, and just so that we're all on the same page to say that the working definition really is the inability to consume an adequate quality or a sufficient quantity of food for health. Or, and making sure that we can do that in socially acceptable ways, where we have choice, where we are actually um, able to access food that we want to eat um, and that's culturally appropriate for us. But it also extends into the anxiety or the worry about being able to do so. So either we're actively skipping meals or we're worrying about where the next meal is coming from. Both of those are embraced really within the definition for food poverty or food insecurity, which, whatever your terminology of choice is. And again, um, to talk to the food insecurity statistic at the population level for Northern Ireland, the most recent um, statistic that we have is from March 2023, where Food Standards Agency research found that one in five of us in Northern Ireland, 22% of us, um, are experiencing food insecurity at some level, whether that be that we have low or very low food security. As I say, we're actively um, missing means, uh, eating less than we should, or we're worrying um, about our ability to do so. So, so much for the food parcels. The food parcels is the tip of the iceberg. For every one of us who um, is in food insecurity and accessing a food parcel, there's about nine of us who don't. So, um, very, very scary statistics. Uh, our we still have a great measure of food insecurity, so there were different ways to ask the question. We used different tools in respect of um, a North American measure in terms of the EU silk. There were different ways to ask how do we um, experience and measure food insecurity. So we weren't in an agreed place yet. So therefore, depending on how you ask the question, somewhere between one in five of us and one in three of us in Northern Ireland reported experiencing at least one food deprivation measure um, with regard to food insecurity. Happily then, in 2019, we arrived at an agreed uh, standardised measure across the UK. And then by 21 to 2023, 
We um, find ourselves working with uh, local councils. We've been working with about three um, to date of the 11 councils across Northern Ireland. Um, with Belfast City Council with respect to co-design approach um, around um, what we can actually usefully do for food insecurity um, across the citizens in that local council area. We've been working with um, a rural council with respect to our at risk of food poverty index in Ulster and we've been working in with the North Coast um, with respect to um, how can we best expand social supermarket expansion. So we're going to look at those three really, really quickly. Um, I guess the take home measure from this map is it's overwhelmingly red. Now that's not to say that you know red is purely bad and green is um, is good in terms of food access. What we've done here, here is we have layered different data sets that have been government endorsed alongside um, actual real time data with respect to food prices and food availability. And we've used the traffic lights in terms of you know red being poorer than amber being um, poorer than green. So the green areas are where food availability is better, where food prices are lower, um, where deprivation is lower, etc, etc. But please note, if you were to zoom into any of those, there would be little pockets of green within the red, with, you know, um, um, red within the green. Um, but you can see that this is, um, not, this is no longer just an urban issue, just a rural issue. Um, this is a widespread population level issue where um, we are at risk of at least food poverty. So we're working to make that ever more elaborate. But in terms of um, social supermarkets and the actual experience of, um, of our people who access food banks, you can see that from the manager's perspective, the, the, the comment is that many people who need help aren't accessing support. And that's endorsed entirely by today's um, data from Trust of Trust, as I say. For every one of us who could be use it, who do use food um, banks, there are another eight, nine of us who should or could. The common causal factor is, without doubt, reduced income. Now that's very reductionist. I get that's so oversimplifying it, but at its um, crux, reduced income is the issue here. Um, not too concerned around food donations to keep food banks going. That seems to be healthy enough from the food manager's perspective. Operating costs are what are concerning us more in terms of this cost of living, energy and income crisis. In terms then of education, and I know full well, it's so, so easy to say the answer to any pol pol political issue is education, um, but education was considered key um, to breaking the cycle of poverty so that people can own um, their own outcomes as well. From the clients' perspectives, um, it's perhaps even more interesting, perhaps even more telling. They, they commented how food parcels weren't just about the food alone. Um, what they actually did was they freed up money to make that money available to afford the other essentials of living, like electricity, gas, oil, petrol, debt repayment, even pet food vet, vet, vet visits. The social aspect, the, the, the welcome you receive in the food bank or the social supermarket was considered to be so, so important, at least equally as important to the food aid received, because it made them feel like a person rather than a failure. All participants in this um, research agreed that the system is broken and that the underlying causes must be identified, they must be eradicated. We know all too well, we talk too many times about how food banks are the sticking plaster to a, um, to a you know, an, um, uh, hemorrhage, really. Um, so we need to be addressing all the time those longer-term, more sustainable issues. We need to strike a balance between taking away the stigma of accessing and putting our foot over the food bank threshold, but doing so without institutionalising the, institutionalizing the need, because we are essentially all agreed that food banks are not the answer. The clients themselves said that they don't actually want charitable food aid to be perpetuated, they don't want it to be institutionalised, they don't want it to be the norm, they don't want it to be the default solution, but they yet are unable to come up with what do we do in their stead. Most important voices, I think, are on this slide with respect to, at one point I wondered what a square off, cut off my curtain would taste like with a bit of butter. Somebody else, uh, a client, a manager, excuse me, said, we've heard of a family who walked to Coleraine to go to the food bank. That's 14,000 steps. You only do that if you're in dire need. Others said, I'm not embarrassed, but at the same time they're saying, I can't believe I have to do this. Others said, I think at the minute there is no stigma because everybody's suffering. Somebody else said, there go I, but for the grace of God, it can go wrong instantly. And others uh, really welcomed the support that their food bank or their social supermarket gave them. The organisation saved my life. The food kept me going. Freed up money to buy coal, when previously I was choosing between buying coal and food. That same lady broke down in tears, and her, social, her food bank manager was so moved by the, the influence that she'd had on that girl's life. 
So looking to the future then, so in 2019 we agreed how we could measure food um, insecurity in a standardised way so that we don't have that huge discrepancy between one and three, <laughs> one and five, how many of us actually are experiencing this. So that was a significant win. But it's not just about continuing to measure, monitor or describe the problem. We absolutely have to take parallel action in a long-term sustainable way. That looks like, and you have the answers, that looks like providing adequate financial resources for food consumption so that we have the money to buy, to choose our own food. That possibly needs to continue to be supplemented by direct food provision where that's appropriate. That sticking, bas uh, that sticking plaster is probably still needed. But it is absolutely a cash-first approach to give the income into the pockets so that people can access food, afford food, choose food in a socially acceptable way. We need to ensure that good quality, nutritious, adequate, culturally appropriate food is easily accessible. And we need to do so um, alongside strengthening the evidence base in parallel with action. But as I say, that's me talking from a research institution. That's not enough. We need to actually effect change on the ground. So looking to the future, looking to policy solutions, the forthcoming anti-poverty strategy, the food strategy framework, all look hopefully hopeful in terms of being important enablers. They'll provide structure to the problem and its solution. They'll provide resource. They'll provide policy impetus to its correction. The co-design aspect is really, really important because um, if you don't do that, it smacks off imposing solutions on people. So let's talk to the people, um, let's provide solutions in concert with them so that they can live with the decisions that are, have been made um, on their behalf. Let them co-own those um, solutions. And in the short term, we absolutely need to continue to fund and focus on our food aid providers and our independent advice organisations for exactly what Kevin said, income maximisation in whichever way. There we go. Apologies for the wreck in the middle. I'm hopefully that's first. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Um, I am just going to ask Sinead, or Siobhan, I should say. Sinead, you've gone through enough. I'm um, going to ask Siobhan to come up. Yeah, is that easier for you, Siobhan, probably? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hello everybody um, and thank you to Alexandra for the invite to speak to you today and to Kira for chairing and to all my fellow speakers who I'm always happy to share a table with. Um, I want to start just by paying tribute to Professor Eileen Evison who I had the pleasure of working with a few times when I worked for Citizens Advice for all her important work for equality, women's rights and in the fight against poverty here. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to speak to you briefly about a couple of pieces of research from the Women's Regional Consortium in relation to poverty. We published research last year on women living with debt, and it won't surprise you to hear that cost of living issues were all over this research and featured heavily in the discussions with women. It illustrated that much of the borrowing they had was simply to make ends meet or to fund essential items. And I've just completed a series of uh, 19 focus group sessions across <coughs> Northern Ireland on the impact of the cost of living crisis on women. I talked with them about the impacts of the crisis on their ability to meet their household bills, their ability to take part in social activities, the impact on their children, their mental and physical health, their debts and caring responsibilities. A summary of the findings from this research will hopefully be published uh, before the summer. We always want the voices uh, of women to be front and centre of our research work, so I will share with you some of the quotes from the focus groups as I make my way through this presentation. So while inflation has been in or around 10% for some time now, the cost of the most basic items has risen considerably more than that. It was widely reported last week that uh, the average price of food has seen its sharpest increase in more than 45 years. So things like sugar, for example, is up 42.1%, milk, cheese and eggs up 29.7%, pasta up 24.1%, and we had the Trussell Trust Food Bank statistics today, which show a 29% increase on last year. So this all gives real cause for concern for those on the lowest incomes who spend a greater proportion of their income on essentials like housing, energy and food compared to better off households. 
At, this is at a time when the Consumer Council for Northern Ireland reported decline in discretionary income for Northern Ireland's lowest earning households. What they have left to spend after paying their bills has dropped to less than £19 a week at a time when the cost of essentials is increasing. And the National Institute of Economic and Social Research has predicted that inflation will remain well above 3% for the whole of 2023 and won't return to the Bank of England's 2% target until 2025. Even if inflation does begin to fall, prices will remain higher than they were before this crisis. So this is the first quote I want to share with you from the research. And this bears out the fact that while inflation is at 10%, women are feeling it much higher than that. They're talking about the costs of all the basics, bread, butter, milk, cooking oil, eggs, cheese, fruit and veg, toilet rolls, bleach, etc. All these basic goods were being raised time and time again, putting real financial strain on these households. And this quote shows the impact of the price rises in terms of energy. We heard a huge amount of feedback from women about increases in energy prices. Many women talked about rationing the heat or not putting it on at all. In this example, this woman wasn't able to put her gas on for a whole week in order to be able to buy food for her two children. So women are more likely uh, to live in poverty and are more likely to be in receipt of benefits and in low paid, part time and precarious work. So economic crises like this one tend to hit them harder. Women were also hit harder by the welfare reform and austerity changes, so they were already in a poor position coming into this crisis. Women also have lower levels of savings than men, and caring responsibilities often mean they are less able to increase their hours of work. Joseph Rowntree Foundation research has found that single parents are by far the most likely of any family type to be struggling with poverty, and most single parents are women. We had countless reports in our research of women acting as the shock absorbers of poverty in the home, going without food, heat and clothes to protect their children. And we're obviously concerned that the cost of living crisis will further increase the number of women getting into debt. Our research shows they have little or no money spare. And when they need money, they're often forced to borrow, often from high cost lenders, due to poor credit ratings or low incomes. We're also concerned about seeing increases in paramilitary lending here. Research by Ulster University found that universal credit was repeatedly described as a driver for illegal lending, particularly around the harm caused by the five-week wait and issues with deductions from benefits to repay loans. We're also finding that mental health issues are very closely associated with struggling with financial hardship and debt. Our research found that 72% of the women we spoke to said they were negatively impacted by being in debt, mainly around their mental health and well-being. In our new research, many, many women are reporting mental health impacts of the cost of living crisis, struggling with the constant worry about money, trying to find cheapest products, being in emergency all the time, anxious about feeding and clothing their children, the relentlessness of it is really evident. More and more more women are having to make difficult decisions about what to spend their household budget on, and these budgets are increasingly being stretched to provide the most basic of items. As this woman says, it's about the decisions she has to make. What am I going to have to do without to provide for my child? And this quote is another example of women acting as the shock absorbers of poverty to protect their children. In this case, this mum was eating dry cereal to ensure she could afford formula for her baby. Many, many mums reported struggling with the costs of baby formula, nappies and school costs. This has clear impacts for their mental health and many of the women we spoke to became particularly emotional when talking about their children and how bad they felt that they were unable to provide for them properly. 
From the, our discussions at the focus group sessions, we found the following, that living on Social Security benefits often does not provide enough income to afford the, the essentials and to meet basic household bills. The impact of increases in the cost of living are putting further strain on the ability of Social Security benefits to meet basic household expenditure. Most of the women reported that they were unable to save. They were either unable to save at all, or what little they were able to put away was quickly being used up in meeting everyday living expenses, usually for quite small items uh, such as school clothing or school shoes. And as I've already stated, women act as the shock absorbers of poverty in the home, going without food and other items to make sure their children have enough. The rising costs of energy and food came up time and time again, as you'd imagine. These issues combined to ensure that household budgets were put under severe financial strain, with many having to make difficult choices, often between heating and eating. Most of the women reported that the level of debt and money worries they were living with had impacted negatively on their mental health, causing stress, anxiety and impacting on their sleep and quality of life. It was clear that living in poverty and with debt and money worries meant that they missed out on living their life to their full potential and that their children frequently missed out on activities and opportunities because of a lack of money. Women talked about a lack of ability to socialise or even to afford relatively small treats like meeting someone for coffee. One of the women said that the three pound that it cost for a cup of coffee would be enough to make her a dinner so she would never entertain buying coffee out. Another talked about going for a rare night out with her friends and then feeling desperately guilty for the rest of the week about the money she spent and thinking how many dinners it would have made. This has clear impacts for their mental health and well-being. We suggest there are a range of actions needed to protect people from poverty, some of which depend on Westminster and the rest, as everybody else has said, on having a functioning Northern Ireland Assembly. There is a need to increase the level of Social Security benefits across the board. The issue now is income, as Kevin has previously raised, and current rates of benefits, even with the uprating this month, are insufficient to meet basic expenditure and allow people to live dignified, healthy lives. There's an issue around uh, government debt deductions from benefits to repay things like advance payments, and the department are working with claimants on reducing these deductions, but it will be important to try and get this information out to people. We also want to see the implementation of the recommendations from the Discretionary Support Review. Um, its recommendations included making more grants than loans, extending the eligibility criteria and recommendations around the Universal Credit Contingency Fund to help people get through the five-week wait, and it seems that most people don't know that that, that exists. Also, the implementation of recommendations from the Welfare Mitigations Review, which suggested strengthening the mitigations package to include a new mitigation for the two-child limit, which would be really beneficial for women and for larger families and also suggested further mitigations to help unpaid carers and people with disabilities. We'd like to see the implementation of the Northern Ireland Anti-Poverty Strategy, and I'll not say more about this as Tras is here to, and an expert on it. And we'd also like to see the introduction of a Northern Ireland Child Payment, which would be an attempt to uh, fight rising child poverty levels, which will undoubtedly be impacted by cost of living increases. In terms of actions that could be taken without an assembly, the existing help available needs to be better communicated to people. I spoke to many women who hadn't heard about the Contingency Fund to help with the five-week wait, or the Advisor Discretion Fund, which, help, which can help uh, with upfront childcare costs, which could be a barrier to work, especially for women. And I'll just finish with this quote that illustrates how many of the women feel in this cost of living crisis and clearly illustrates the need for things to change to protect them, their children and families and communities from the negative impacts of this crisis. Thank you. Thanks so much, Siobhan. And last but certainly not least, we have Tracy Canavan from Bernardo's. And just to put it into perspective, folks, in 1948, when the National Assistance Act was introduced, 
benefits made up about 20% of people's uh, income that it, that they have lost. And now today, even with that 10.1% inflationary raise, it makes up about 12.5%. So it gives you an idea of just how inadequate it is to meet the the essential needs that people have. Okay, Tressa. So um, thanks for having me here today, and um, thanks to the previous speakers. I think it's been a really insightful um, kind of discussion so far. I suppose what I'm here to talk to you about is the anti-poverty strategy. So. Um, I'll talk a bit about the process and, and why it might be me here talking to you right now about the anti-poverty strategy, look a bit about the recommendations that the co-design group made and then where are we now and what's coming. But before I do that, I suppose a bit of reflection on the need for an anti-poverty strategy in the first place. Um, I mean, we're all talking about the cost of living crisis now, but there's no need for this situation to be the way that it is. and. We actually shouldn't have people living in poverty in our society. That's not something that we should accept. Um, one in four of our children grew up in poverty. And as Siobhan said, you know, we anticipate that number is just going to get worse. But it's been that way for 20 years. Um, and whenever we look at, say, for example, the Good Friday Agreement and the celebrations around that, we're looking to the future. What future are we promising our children? What have we delivered in those 25 years? Is this really what we were aiming for? And I'm not so sure that it is. Um, and we're here to talk today, and it is really heavy, but it's really important to remember that poverty is a solvable problem. This is something that we can do something about, and we should do something about. It actually will benefit everybody if we begin to deliver for not just our children, but our families, our societies, people who live in our society and need our help. And that could be any one of us any day. So just kind of wanted to, to set that in a bit of context and it is heavy, but we can do something about it and it's important. So the anti-poverty strategy, I mean, we were really pleased when in late um, 2020, Minister Hargey kind of got the ball rolling on the development of an anti-poverty strategy. Um, and I know we have Greti in the room who was on the expert advisory panel and they produced a report and that was really the first stage of this process. So it provided the foundation for beginning these conversations with the co-design group. Um, so throughout 2021, the Department for Communities convened a co-design group which got together to talk about the expert panel's report and use that as a really strong foundation for our discussions. What, what can we do to kind of maybe add on to this? Are there any areas where we think we could bolster additional support? Um, and what we did was we kind of looked at the life cycle approach taken by the expert advisory panel but also added in place based and then a kind of catch-all as well which was kind of services and other areas which could be forgotten about. Um, so the the concept of co-design, um, some people say everybody has a different interpretation of what co-design is but they're really fundamental principles that we need in co-design for it to be called co-design um, and Sinead you were talking a bit about co-design. Unfortunately, we as a group got to a stage where we felt that this process wasn't actually delivering. It wasn't something that we felt was truly co-design and we weren't. it wasn't something that we could stand over. So we had discussions with the department and the minister to talk about what could this group do separately to the department um, to deliver on a, a kind of recommendations piece. Um, so and just to say, I haven't actually mentioned this, the group that was in the co-design group was really um, a broad representation across society. So you had children's organisations, you had older people's organisations, you had advice, you had um, disability organisations, um, you had our unions. It was really, really fantastic. And whenever we got together as a group to look at what those recommendations should be, it was co-design. Nobody came with kind of, this is definitely going to be there and no chance you're talking about this. Everything was up for discussion. And I think that really strengthened the paper. Um, something that the group will acknowledge is that you know, this group wasn't the be all and end all of everything and this is the start of a process. So before I kind of get into that next steps bit, um, just to give you a bit of an idea about what the recommendations looked like. So we really wanted to make sure that we're tackling poverty on a really structural fundamental level. We've been tinkering around the edges for a long time, doing bits over here, oh that looks really well there. Um, but actually that none of that's been working, we're, we're still in this situation. So what are the structural things that we need to change? What are the, what's the big brave action that we can take as a society to fundamentally shift poverty here? Um, and so we wanted systemic change. We also wanted a rights-based approach. You know, as Sinead touched upon, we have rights as people here in Northern Ireland. Um, they deserve to be delivered on. Um, we need to uphold people who are living in poverty with dignity and 
make sure that their rights are being delivered for them and we hope that this the recommendations that we have capture that um, and as I said it took a life cycle and um, place based and service based approach so just to give you an idea and I'm not going to recite all of it and the recommendations paper that we did publish in October past was nearly 100 pages long it's on the NICFA website so you're more than welcome to read it but and I won't go through it all obviously um, but just to touch upon the vision um, because I think it's an important piece to set the tone for what we were looking to achieve it was that Northern Ireland is an equal society where poverty and its impacts are eradicated and that respects protects promotes and fulfills the rights of those at risk of poverty to ensure they achieve their aspirations and it was really important for us that we talked about eradication. I don't want to talk about reducing poverty. That means that we accept that there's always going to be a certain number of people living in poverty, that that's okay, that we can just have a baseline of people always living in poverty and we're fine with that. That's not okay. We want to aim for eradication of poverty and we were very, very clear on that vision. Um, and also it's about achieving their aspirations. So we're not going to put on to anybody else what you should be trying to achieve with your life or what your <coughs> vision of the future looks like. But as long as we have the right systems and supports in place that you can achieve what you want to achieve, then I think we're in a really good place. So the, in working towards that strategic vision, as I say, there were, there were six outcomes in taking this wide approach. So the first was around the creation of an anti-poverty act um, and alongside that a commissioner. And we thought this was really important because having targets that were set in legislation really holds accountable our politicians, our civil service to deliver on this. And we've seen it work really well in Scotland where you can see when they're getting to the time where they're going to have to measure themselves against those targets, you begin to see action, you begin to say, goodness, what do we need to invest in over here and how do we... Um, deliver on that because it's going to be very clear if you haven't met those targets and a commissioner because we want to make sure that the voice of people with lived experience of poverty at risk of poverty is being heard they have someone who's advocating for them consistently not just when there's a cost of living crisis not just when it's in the headlines but all the time so that was our first outcome. The second um, was around child poverty, again, working towards eradication. Um, and the key new action in that outcome, but also right across the board, was a child payment. Um, and the reason why is because this would be a really significant investment that we could make in Northern Ireland to lift children out of poverty. Children are more likely to be in poverty than any other age group, but also they don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in families, they exist in their communities and their schools. So that has ripple effects. And the child payment that we had suggested was £20 per week per child, um, passported by access to social um, security benefits. And it's really important that we put money in families' pockets. Again, you know, providing a service over here and the banks, you know, the trust of trust do fantastic work, but they don't actually want to have to do that work in the first place. If we give families the dignity of having money to buy the food that they want to buy, then we're achieving our aims. Um, so that was outcome two, and again, there's lots under each of those outcomes. I, I won't go through them all, but outcome three was around working age poverty. So how do we make sure that work is valuable and rewarding for people? How do we make sure that the systems around them support them to be able to engage in work? So we're also looking at things like childcare. We're looking at um, living wage and also those all those conditions of being in work, being able to meaningfully participate in employment. Um, outcome four was around older people. So again, we know the specific barriers and challenges for older people living in poverty. What is it that we need to do to make sure that they have access to the support the services that they need um, and taking their needs into account whenever we design those is really, really important. Um, outcome five was around that place-based approach. So we had some really fantastic um, recommendations there around investing in our communities, making sure they're vibrant, making sure that people feel part of their community and their community supports them as well. And finally, outcome six, this was really a catch-all for anything else that we couldn't fit neatly under the other areas. So that was things like our looked after children, our traveller communities. It was also housing, which is a huge area of work. Um, and, and for example, our advice and things like that, access to digital um, and online services. So we'd encourage you to go and have a read of this. It was really comprehensive. but. I think it's also really important to say that this is by no means the end of the process. It's where we got to as a group, but we actually hope that this is the start of engagement. If you have any thoughts, feel free to contact me, um, but also feel free to contact the department who are really, really open to feedback, we hope. Um, we haven't actually seen the draft strategy or where it's at at the moment as a co-design group, um, which, which 
we think is a bit challenging because we don't know how the work that we've done has fed into where they're at. Um, unfortunately, we have been told that it's not going any further without a minister and an executive to approve it, which is hugely disappointing because there's been a huge amount of work that's gone on to get us here and expertise. Um, and we see the impact of the cost of living, even shifting what we've recommended over the past few months. We know that it needs to be updated. It mightn't be a document that's even relevant exactly right now. We need to move it to a place where it is. Um, so I would really encourage you to continue to agitate. I think that one, the reasons why the co-design group wanted to release this paper were twofold. One was around transparency. So there's often times when we have policy development in government where it's hidden behind closed doors. How did we get there? Why did we make that recommendation? Why is this the thing that we're putting our money into? Um, we want to be really clear. This is the process that we took part in as a group. This is where we got to and this is what we're recommending. Um, but also around that momentum and holding government to account to say, this is a start. Let's keep going. Let's not let this fall off the radar. And so our plea is that when the assembly returns that this is a day one priority it's not something that we start to start from scratch again and say oh let's convene another group to look at a thing that takes two years and we're back where we started we can move on this we know what the problem is we know what action is needed we just need to start delivering now um so yes i'm really looking forward to the discussion and any questions obviously at the end we're happy to take them Thanks so much, Tressa. Um, I'll not even start commenting on how disappointing it is to hear what has happened with the anti-poverty strategy. Needless to say, it would just drive you to despair, but I think it was an excellent move to publish the recommendations and I think that everybody agitating in their own ways will make a difference and it's fundamental that we do keep this on the agenda.